I'd like to introduce you to Alicia Choi. Alicia is a, uh, an economist, but she's also a data, data analyst. We've asked Alicia to give us some ideas on what Australia is thinking about Aboriginal issues. And so through that data analysis, it gives us a bit of an idea how and what we should be targeting in terms of information to get to the uh, uh, population in Australia. I think Alicia is going to do some further work through her company. Um, normally, she'd cost charges a million dollars um, to do this work, but um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of information that we can gain from this, um, because if we're going to start a campaign to win the hearts and minds of, of uh, different Australian people, because there are, after all, 45% of the population um, in Australia, or 65%, I think it is, 65% of Australian population right now are born of families who come from foreign countries since then. So the colonialists are starting to die out. And, um, and uh, so they're being assimilated into the new Australians, and uh, whereas we're standing our grounds on our own. And so the information that Alicia can furnish to us will allow us to be able to target how we develop a strategy to communicate with the Australian public and, and push our hopes and aspirations into, the, into their arena um, so that we, we're going to work and be able to foster and nurture that support that's out there uh, to help us take our position and to move our stuff forward. So I'll, without further ado, I'll uh, prove you to leave. Are you there? I'm Sorry. Here. You're right here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, all the elders, and we had some dis distinguished guests here from various embassies. Um, thank you for welcoming me. I um, just so you know, I'm an Australian citizen, and I migrated from Hong Kong in the 80s. So um, I am. It's funny, you know. Uh, is there a coincidence that I am from Hong Kong? Because Hong Kong only recently decolonized. <laughs> So um, today I'm really pleased to be talking to you uh, from a perspective that's quite different to what you're probably used to hearing about. So what I'm going to present to you is uh, some insights, unique insights into the research that I do, which is essentially predicting the future behaviour of people based on understanding emotions. So I use big data, I use advanced analytics, and I uncover sentiment and what people deeply care about. So when Michael asked me to come and speak here today, the question that we're going to answer using this style of research, and it's predictive of the future, the question is, does Australian society care about First Nations and Aboriginal people? So we've learnt that language has immense power and words have immense power long after they have been spoken. And we know that words create narratives and stories that shape our perception and understanding of our world. And we know that words have power to influence and control. So Professor Gary is just taking you through the power of tropes, which has been a technique used for centuries to control the masses, to control the psyche of the population. So as an economist and seer of the future, I use big data and advanced analytics to predict how people will behave. And all of this is really important to understand in the context of today. So I also study major elections and referendums. And in the last five years, I've seen how the power of language has been used to influence a population. And so as a student of the world, I study people, cultures, and societies. And so I use this technique to get into the heads of everyday people that use the internet. And using this method, I have predicted the outcome of some major elections. You may have heard of the recent US presidential election in 2020, so Trump versus Biden. All of the major polls in the, in the world were saying that it was going to be a Biden landslide. Now, we all know that it was not a landslide by any means. Trump narrowly lost, right? 
However, using my research, I was able to accurately predict the outcome of seven of nine key battleground states that determined the election outcome. I've also predicted trivial things like the winner of the voice competition, you know, the singing competition. Now, I've done it three years straight in a row. So it's no fluke, it's not magic, it's art and science. And some people call me dangerous. Well, sports bet calls me dangerous, I can tell you that. <laughs> Melbourne Cup. I always get the question about Melbourne Cup. We, we can't do Melbourne Cup because that relies on horses, you know, the best horse to win, and my method does not have magic over that, that sort of thing. So, um, so when you have the ability to see what I see, which is essentially looking at societies and how people think and feel, it's really important when you're coming up with a campaign, which is essentially messaging, which is essentially using words to influence people, right? So all I'm here to do today is tell you the truth that I see from the data. So in the context of today's event, we are starting the conversation about where to from here. And so what is the pathway to decolonization and sovereign reinstatement of rights to self-determination? These are big words and these are big narratives and this requires big thinking and big data. So you can't research questions of this nature using traditional methods, which are your surveys or polls or focus groups, because it's such a complicated topic. And I'm talking about narratives such as First Nations, Native Title, Aboriginal, Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, etc. And I'll show you the results of what I'm finding here. So in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to be sharing with you my unique insights into this research because ultimately we want to answer the question, what does Australian society today think and feel about First Nations and Aboriginal people? So 50 years on from the establishment of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy here in Canberra, where is Australian society today? Have you progressed in a substantive way? Does Australian society care? So Gila Rapp Michael has asked me to help spark this conversation that you will have later on this afternoon. And with all re big research questions, they have to be carefully crafted. And so I'm gonna take you through how I have come up with my answer on what does Australia think and feel about First Nations. Now, I wanna to refer to um, a quote by the legendary general Sun Tzu, Art of War. He says, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. There's been more than 100 battles, right, over, over our history. And so to dream up where to from here, we must understand where we are now. So to design a path of decolonization, we must understand the colonizers. And so what I mean by that is we must understand what white Australia thinks and feels about First Nations. So I've analysed some key narratives you can see up there, and these are key narratives that have shaped what I call the sentiment and psyche of what it means for Aboriginal and for First Nations peoples in Australia. These are only just a few, it's not exhaustive, but it was just a selection of some of the key events, key issues, key topics, some of which are still ongoing. So these are all interrelated narratives. It's a highly complex issue. So in my work, as I measure public sentiment of people and society, I've seen how public sentiment has been used as a cornerstone of policy in this country, in all, in all countries. So policy shapes future change. Without changes in policy, society cannot evolve. So when I research and provide insights to clients that are governments, companies and leaders, I'm talking to them about how they need to remain relevant. Because if you're not relevant, nobody cares. And if, Australian, if the Australian society doesn't care, nothing will change, right? So to answer the question of where to from here, we need to answer where are we now? Which starts with, does Australia care? So the question I can hear you all asking in your head is, so how do I do this? I will show you. So people are irrational. We're all irrational. We make decisions by emotions. Emotions drive behavior, but strong emotions 
change behaviour. So what I'm picking up in my research is measuring affect or emotions. So imagine if you love or hate something, you change your behaviour, you do something. If you mildly like something or you mildly think something's annoying, you'll forget about it, right? So it's the intensity of emotions that create a change in behaviour. The change in behaviour becomes trends in society and creates trends and changes in our culture. Now, when I do this research, 93% of narratives, which a narrative is essentially a word or a string of words, okay? So 93% of narratives is what I consider noise. People don't care, 93%. So it's the 7% that we look for. It's the 7% of narratives that get people up out of their seats, potentially protesting or changing the way they vote, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just gonna quickly explain how I do this. And it all starts with data. And data is essentially information that can be stored electronically for analysis. It can be created by our everyday actions and behaviours and events. Data is in the form of words, videos, texts, SMSs, all, you name it. All of this can be collected and analysed and is created by humans as well as machines. So what does that really mean? Well, every day, 2.5 quintillion bytes of data is created. What is a quintillion? A quintillion is one to the power of 18. So imagine one with 18 zeros, bytes of data followed by it. So this is what 2.5 quintillion bytes of data looks like in a number. But what does that really mean? Okay, you see here, there's a cube. So this is a cube representing one quintillion coins stacked up in a cube. Now, you can see in the, in the bottom corner, there's a tiny white speck, and that's drawn to scale, representing the Empire State Building, which is one of the tallest buildings in the world. It's over 300 metres high. Now, just looking at the relativities to Uluru, it's pretty much a similar length of Uluru. So imagine every single day, 2.5 cubes of data is being created. Now, most of this sits outside on the internet. So in, on the internet, we have websites, blogs, social media, you name it, right? So this is the world that I mine to understand culture and people. So we are the yellow dot. We are surrounded by oceans of data. And because we're in the 21st century, we have the ability to mine this data accurately and at speed. So what we see here, love this one, basically we analyse millions of behavioural interactions online when you engage with content, with news, any information about your world that forms your perception. Now this information we collect and analyse and understand and we uncover what you deeply care about. Are we all still following? Yes, good. So the two key things that I find coming out of this analysis that I'm going to explain to you is number one, is it important to society? So you will see this quadrant on the screen. The top two quadrants represent what I call timeless or transformational narratives. Now it's a very complex mathematical algorithm that runs this information. And what it tells us is that something that is timeless, a timeless narrative, is important to society, is deeply relevant and engaging. 5% of narratives sit in that quadrant called timeless, which is the top left. Now, occasionally we see narratives that are not only important and relevant, but they're on the move. So when they're on the move, we call them transformational. And only 2% of narratives we research in general are transformational. They are the change the world narratives. Now the bottom two quadrants are transient and tribal, and they form the rest of the 93% of noise. So you imagine with most of the stuff we have going on in our world, people generally care deeply about a handful of issues. So when I present results from the study, this is one of the core output. Is it relevant to society today? The second output that's interesting is depicting emotion in what I call an emotion wheel. 
So this is a very good description of how the mood and sentiment of the general consensus population is feeling at any point in time about a narrative. I like this chart because it, it says five things in one. So the colour denotes the sentiment. Positive is green, red is negative, and we have expectational cues which come in sort of like purple or blue. So the strength of the emotion is the strength of the colour. And each individual, there's little um, arcs that form the overall picture. They represent individual emotions. So we categorise over 400 emotions into ultimately two hero emotions, love or fear. So when you look at this chart, you can quickly see the intensity of the emotion, the overall makeup of the feel of the, of the population, but you also get to understand there's breadth and depth of emotion, which I won't go into here, but you will see some charts that look like this that I'll show you very soon. So where have we applied this before to, t to prove to you that it's predictive of the future? Well, back in January 2018, we did a really big study on climate change. And so we researched 100 narratives around the topic of climate change. So things like electric vehicles, solar, renewable energy, sustainable cities, et cetera, et cetera. Now you can see the results on the quadrant there that I just, that I just explained to you. Most of the stuff sits in either timeless or transient. However, we picked two narratives that were popping out in the transformational quadrant in the circle, and they were in relation to um, some campaigns, some grassroots campaigns that were obviously very successful. And what were these campaigns? They were the Generation Yes campaign, which was something in relation to climate change that was um, seeded by school children, at the school children level. So those were transformational narratives back in January 2018. So that signaled to the market that there was movement and deep um, momentum particularly amongst young people. So we roll forward the clock to March 2019, and the picture you have on the left is 40,000 school children protesting around Australia on climate change. And if you remember, Scott Morrison said, go back to school, right? Around this time, we had the rise of an individual named Greta Thunberg. And so she obviously was the representative of the youth speaking about climate change. And so in September 2019, there was the global climate change strike, of which I think there were 400,000 people in Australia alone, right, uh, marching for climate change. So if you actually think about that in context, Australians are pretty complacent people. Like, I've, I grew up here. I speak, I speak, I can turn on ochre if I wanted to. I can speak the Australian, I'm, I'm Australian, right? So most of us are pretty complacent. We don't get off our bums to do anything. We don't fight, we don't really protest, but to have 400,000 people protest for climate change in September 2019 really meant something. So again, these are the signals that happened in market that we predicted back in January 2018, 18 months before. Does that get you excited? Because it gets me excited. So when I looked at the issue of COVID vaccine over the last two years, um, and here I'm gonna introduce, you know, back to the idea of language and, and tropes. So looking at this question, it was is really to understand what's the lay of the land in relation to the COVID vaccine? Are we going to get the jab? So I've been looking at this since early 2020 as well. And so what I'm gonna show you is some results of some narrative analyses on some of the common um, words that were used in order to get us to get the jab. The first two were COVID jab and vaccine hesitancy. So you can see here that both narratives are timeless, which makes sense. It was, it was all over the media, it affected all of our lives, but COVID jab had a very different emotional profile than co uh, vaccine hesitancy. But following the narrative of vaccine hesitancy over time, what you see here is the emotion wheel for um, the time period of November 2020. Now, if you turn back your mind to what was happening in the world, in Australia at that time, this was prior to, we just had COVID land in 2020. We'll figure out what, what it all meant. We were hopeful and we had expectation, which is the blue, coming through about a hero vaccine that was gonna come through, right? This was before they didn't order enough. So there was a lot of expectation and things were relatively mild. It was very important and everybody was watching. 
By the time we hit February 2021, this was when stuff in the news was coming out saying AstraZeneca's out, people started getting blood clots, there was some fear starting to kick in, and then there was the issues of we didn't order enough, we know, what are we going to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The story started to unfold. Now, when I show you the next one, in March 2021, vaccine hesitancy turned dominant, intense, negative. Right, so you can see how in a very short time, there was a lot of, um, I suppose you can call it campaigning to drum up fear, which is, you can see here, highly successful. So back in March 2021, this is just prior to the lockdowns that most of Australia ended up suffering for, right, mo for the rest of the year. There was a lot of fear. There was, he vaccine hesitancy was very strong. And unfortunately, the government at that time did not um, respond to this fear. There was still a lot of the messaging saying, trust, trust us, it's safe, it's safe, it's safe. But you can t clearly see here that if the market is feeling intense fear about something and you're not addressing the fear, people don't really listen to you and they don't trust you, right? So when I looked at the COVID vaccination versus COVID jab narratives, both of them mean exactly the same thing, immunisation against COVID, right? You can see the profile emotionally for COVID jab and going back to the word jab, which is a trope, it strikes a lot more negative sentiment and fear than using just the word COVID vaccination. Now, if you remember, there were a lot of campaigns that were forcing the word jab, 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 right? Rolling up your sleeve, images on TV and posters of needles, right? So it's, it, isn't it ironic? They're trying to get people to get the vaccination, but then there's all this visual and word cues that strike fear. There you go, case in point. So where to from here? So coming back to the question here for today, do Australians care about First Nations narratives? Do they care about the Aboriginal peoples? Um, and so when I looked at this, I was highly interested to see the outcome. I had my own hypotheses about the outcome, and unfortunately, I think I was right. So, <laughs> so these are the narratives that I looked at, and I'm going to talk you through them one by one. First one, First Nations and Native Title. Now you see here that is in the bottom left quadrant, which is transient, meaning people don't care. Australian society does not care. The second one, stolen generations. Again, transient. Australian society does not care. Now when I refer to Australian society, it's general mass population. It's mainstream heartland Australia. It's not the people sitting here. It's not the ethnic, it's everybody. But let's face it, it's um, also this sort of analysis is a product of the media, the media system. So if you've got stolen generations, Australia doesn't care. Aboriginal land rights, Australia doesn't care. Uluru Statement from the Heart, Australia doesn't care. Aboriginal deaths in custody, Australia doesn't care. However, I note that it's probably on the cusp and has potential to move to timeless. I'll show you some of the emotion wheels behind this as well. And the last one, two weeks ago, we had the uh, fire that was created at the old parliament house, which was essentially a smoking ceremony gone wrong. So uh, two weeks ago was also Christmas and New Year period. In the media cycle, very, very slow. People were on holidays. Nobody paid attention to the news. So the assessment in general of it also being not important, Australia doesn't care, doesn't surprise me. And the fact that it's right in the bottom left meant it didn't even move the needle anywhere, which was really interesting. Because if we remember, we had the, um, the storming of the capital in the US, which went all over the world. And that was, I would say, if I looked at it then, it would have been highly timeless or maybe even transformational, right? We had something similar, not of the same scale, but we had something similar here in Canberra, in Australia. Australia didn't care. So I'm really sorry to say that the assessment of where we are is that um, right now, Australia does not care uh, about First Nations and Aboriginal peoples. And I'll, I've got some theories as to why we are at this point today, but I think it's important to tell you that if you're thinking about ways to decolonise, this is actually what the colonists think, right? They don't care. 
So when I look at the emotional profiles here, you can see Aboriginal deaths in custody, Uluru Statement, generally speaking, you know, with the emotions, it's generally negative. So people, you know, if you were to ask the everyday person on the street and tell them a little bit about the issue, they generally would be very unhappy with it, right? However, it's not enough. Not enough people care enough. And I believe that's insufficient media coverage in the way it's talked about. And also, these are very complicated issues. What does deaths in custody really mean, right? The word deaths, I think, has become banal, which is normalised. People don't care. It's just a boring word. So when something becomes banal in narrative world, it's danger zone. It means it's dead. So the fact that they've been able to use the word deaths in custody to really cover up essentially Aboriginal suicide or police brutality leading to deaths, Aboriginal people's death in jail, if you actually spoke about it in what it truly was without wrapping it up in tropes or metaphors, etc., I think people will actually get it. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. So again, when I continue on, I'm looking at stolen generations, passive, mild colours, I look at this and go, there's nothing in here. First Nations and native title, again, nothing in here. Then you look at Aboriginal land rights, again, pale, nothing here, moving on, right? This is the state of where we are now. Now, you're probably asking the question, because I did, looking at this, going, there's got to be something that people care about. There was one. So from another study with another client, uh, there's, here's a narrative on Duke and Gorge. So Duke and Gorge happened in May 2020, and this was a read taken just last month. So, you know, over a year or two years later, or close to two years later, the Duke and Gorge narrative is timeless. It's relevant, right? And the emotions behind that were much stronger negative. So the question is, why is Duke and Gorge more relevant than stolen generations or Aboriginal deaths in custody? That was the question I had in my head. What I think is the answer is that narratives, if they're very simple to understand, like Duke and Gorge, you know, a mining company destroyed an ancient Aboriginal site. That's a pretty easy story to understand, right? Uh, whereas Aboriginal deaths in custody, Aboriginal land rights, First Nations, most people will say, what is that? What does it mean? And at the end of the day, what does it mean to me? So there's a lot of groundwork, I believe, that needs to be done in educating the general population, white Australia, the colonial, colonists. I myself would call myself, I wouldn't say a colonist, oh, but I did come from Hong Kong, which was colonised at the time. But, you know, when I grew up in Australia, and I'm a product of the Australian education system, I never learned anything about First Nations people or Aboriginal culture. We learned way too much about Christopher Columbus and pioneers and, you know, the white settlers. So you think there's a whole population of people like me that have absolutely no ground foundation in knowledge and awareness of these issues. So if you're trying to come up with a campaign, this is where you have to start. So that's one part of, I think, um, why we are here today. So where to from here? By doing this initial study, and I said it's not exhaustive, but it was enough to tell us that we have a long way to go. Okay, that's if you require public sentiment for your cause. If you're fighting this on a legal basis, uh, that's a separate pathway, but I believe that there needs to be some sort of conversation that needs to be had with mainstream Australia in order for them to care. How do we make people care? So my, I've got a couple of points that are summary views and insights as to where we are. One, we don't care. You can see that right now. Two, these narratives have become banal, boring, not interesting, danger zone, dead. Three, we have very low understanding. So sitting behind all this analysis is like petabytes of data, articles, hundreds and thousands of articles and words have been analysed, right? So we actually have a low understanding of these issues. We don't really understand them. We also lack, number four, I can see that we lack mainstream media coverage. So the most powerful media that is shaping these narratives are three, ABC, The Guardian, and SBS. It's none of the major um, media outlets owned by Fairfax or Murdoch. So until you get those platforms on board with your message, I think it's gonna be very difficult to cut through to the Australian population. 
The fifth thing, oh, I mentioned the fifth thing, it's ABC and Guardian. The sixth one is that, um, so going back to Duke and Gorge, so simple narratives are easy to cut through. Big topics like stolen generations, deaths in custody, they need a lot more work to help people understand the different angles and ultimately, at the end of the day, start, sh start sharing the stories because all of this, all this truth is told through story and I would love to hear more stories but we just don't have the opportunity to unless you meet somebody and hear their story. But again, if you want to cut through in a mass media campaign, you, can't have the, you don't have the time to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. There's got to be a way to allow you to share your true stories with everybody. And the last thing is, um, this is a, a narrative that I decided to share on um, Novak Djokovic. So we've all heard about the visa, visa debacle that went on for way too long in the media. So just take a look at this again. Within a short space of two weeks, that narrative became timeless. Now, there's many angles as to why that became, uh, but why that captured Australian society's relevance and engagement. And so, when you look at the emotional content behind that, generally speaking, people were pretty angry with this fiasco. But when I looked under the, under the hood, what was the content that was most engaging in shaping this narrative in the Australian population? Memes. Memes about Djokovic. So, you know, makes me realise how low of a base Australian society is in understanding our world. <laughs> I mean, it's the truth. I see this a lot in other studies that we do, right? But that's, that, that's who you're dealing with. So that's who, you know, the enemy is, right? So how do we make people care it's all about emotion. So how do we bring these true stories to life? How do we get the support, you know, pull on the heartstrings of everyday Australians? And, you know, 50 years on, where are we now? Well, we're still where we are, I think, from 1972, to be honest. But the face of um, Australia has changed dramatically in the last 50 years. The likes of myself and many migrants um, have landed in, on Australia and called this our home. You know, we all have stories too. So I think the whole idea of truth telling and stories to create emotion is something that's some, an opportunity that we have here, but I don't know how you cut through with the media and that I don't have an answer to that one. So um, in that respect, I think, you know, this, this is how I see the future at the moment. It's, it's a difficult struggle, uh, but it's the truth. I wish I had a better story to tell you, but this is where we stand today in January, 2022. So on that note, I welcome any questions.